Welcome to the Manufacturing Engineering Media webinar series. Our presentation today is Motor Trends, Additive Manufacturing Drives Production of Race Ready Cars, sponsored by Stratasys Incorporated. Hello, I'm Mike Anderson, a senior editor at ME Media. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to provide some background on what we'll be doing today. Our sponsor today is Stratasys Incorporated. The first person we will hear from is Kim Killoran of Stratasys. She will provide insight into Stratasys and review what additive manufacturing is all about. Then Kim will bring in Alan Creamer, Direct Digital Manufacturing Technology Leader Automotive at Stratasys, and Paul Doe, Chief Designer for Rally Projects at ProDrive. Kim's introduction and the presentation by Alan and Paul have been pre-recorded. While that means any questions you have will not be answered today, be aware that you may still ask questions. Simply use the Q&A box that will appear on the right side of the screen. We'll collect these questions and pass them along and answers will be emailed to you. Another point, as often happens with viewing videos over the internet, the quality of the presentation can be affected by the type of internet connection you have, the amount of total bandwidth available to you, and the number of people accessing that bandwidth at the time. If you experience difficulty, please let us know by way of the Q&A box. The presentation is pre-recorded but we'll be with you live all the way through. If you have questions about any other aspects of our webinars, please email me at manderson, M-A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N, at sme.org. I'll rejoin you after the presentation with a few concluding remarks. Now here's Kim Kaloran of Stratasys. Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Motor Trends, Additive Manufacturing Drives Production of Race-Ready Cars. My name is Kim Kaloran, and I will be your host for today's event. Before we get into today's topic, I wanted to give you a little overview of who Stratasys is. For those of you who aren't familiar with our company, Stratasys makes 3D printers and production systems based on patented Fused Deposition Modeling, or FDM, technology that can produce prototypes and production parts directly from 3D CAD data using engineering-grade thermoplastic. We also operate Red Eye on Demand, which is an online rapid prototyping and digital manufacturing service. And as you may have recently heard, Stratasys has merged with Object, which is an Israeli-based manufacturer of 3D printers that use inkjet-based polyjet processes to create a 3D model. Today, we're giving you a pit row pass of sorts. We're very excited to give you a glimpse behind the scenes of motorsports. We'll tell you all about production applications of additive manufacturing for race cars. Specifically, we'll be covering applications that use FDM technology, which stands for Fused Deposition Modeling. And Alan and Paul, our presenters, will tell you what's being done, why, and how. So I'd like to welcome our speakers today. Alan Kramer is Stratasys Digital, Direct Digital Manufacturing Technology Leader for Automotive. He has seven years of experience in motorsports on various racing teams. He also spent 11 years at Honda R&D at their technical center in central Ohio. While there, he added, advanced the use of FDM technology and headed up the additive manufacturing lab. He was also supervisor of the CNC and fabrication shop, leading a group of fabric fabricators in a fast-paced research environment. Aside from his professional credentials, Alan is a huge fan of all kinds of motor racing, so we're very happy to have him with us today. I'd also like to welcome Paul Doe, who is the Chief Designer for Rally Projects for ProDrive, based in the UK, and the force behind the new Mini World Rally Championship car. Paul has worked in motor racing his entire career and, for the last 14 years, has been lucky enough to design World Rally Cars and Le Mans prototypes for companies operating at the highest level. Paul has devoted the last three years to helping ProDrive bring the Mini back to the World Rally Championship. And now, without further ado, Alan, the floor is yours. Thanks, Kim. 
So dating back as far as I can remember, Stratasys has been playing a pivotal role in the vehicle design and manufacturing with companies like Ford, BMW, Hyundai, Dana, Ducati, Polaris, and Clockworks. But I have to say the most interesting and exciting work at the, is in the motorsports arena. Uh, who can resist the thrill and prestige of racing? And it's interesting because it's shrouded in mystery. To keep their competitive advantage, most teams rarely divulge all that they are doing. This is especially true when it comes to additive manufacturing. While I am bound by confidentiality and therefore unable to name all the theories and teams that use Stratasys FDM additive manufacturing systems, I can tell you that we cover most, if not all, leagues that you can think of. Additive manufacturing has been a pivotal tool in helping race teams achieve top speed and top performance. With that said, you're in for a treat because three teams have green flagged us to talk about the role FDM plays in their shops. Stuart Haas Racing is a NASCAR competitor with numbers 10, 14, and 39 cars. Behind the wheel on those teams are well-known drivers like Tony Stewart, Ryan Newman, and Danica Patrick. Joe Gibbs Racing, also in NASCAR, has drivers Danny Hamlin in the number 11 FedEx Toyota, Kyle Busch driving the 18 M&M's Toyota, Joey Logano, the number 20 Home Depot Toyota, and in the Nationwide Series, Brian Scott with the number 11 Toyota. Stratasys is a proud sponsor of Joe Gibbs Racing. ProDrive, which has teams and customers in World Sports Car Racing, the World Rally Championship, and the Australian V8 Supercar Championship Series. They have 14 titles and wins spanning Le Mans, WRC, and British Touring Car Championships. Paul, am I leaving anything out? Uh, there's, there's various numerous uh, national championship wins as well in there. You'll hear some exciting stories from Paul a bit later. One area that race teams are really tight-lipped about is direct digital manufacturing, or DDM, applications. This growing trend has been developing for years, but few would talk about it. DDM, simply put, is using additive manufacturing to make production parts meaning that their FDM parts will endure the rigors of a 500-mile race or four-day on- and off-road rally. But the great news is that SHR, JGR, and ProDrive have agreed to give you a glimpse into their activities. The takeaway of this webinar is that the misconceptions of manufacturing parts by additive means that they're not strong enough, tough enough, or precise enough are completely false, as these three companies prove. If an FDM part can survive 100-foot jumps, 5G impacts, and 200-mile-per-hour speeds, I think you'll agree that there's plenty of opportunity for your products. Race after race proves that FDM parts have the durability and quality needed on the track as well as in everyday products. The other takeaway is the transition from prototyping into production. All three teams added FDM for purpose of just prototyping and testing. And over time, with an open eye and open mind to new opportunities and any means to give them a competitive advantage, they discovered new applications where FDM could deliver what their other tools could not. I'll let Paul share his progression later, but I'll describe SHR's and JGR's leads lead up to DDM. I'll start with Stuart Haas Racing. The team is most recent of the three that we are featuring today to adopt FDM. About a year ago, they added FDM as a tool to accelerate rollout of new designs through fast turn models and functional prototypes. FTM not only made the process faster, it also reduced the demands on their machine shop and money spent on materials. We spoke with Matt Johnson, the senior design engineer, and he said, we always find changes from our prototypes. With FTM, we make revised parts without having to take time to do a new CNC machine setup and procure more material. That's a bit of an interesting situation since one of the team's backers, Haas, as in Haas CNC machines, makes the very equipment that additive manufacturing supposedly competes with. But Matt set us straight, it's not really a competition as either or, rather FDM complements the CNC tools. When it makes sense to use the right tool for the job, Stuart Haas Racing really uses that. Now, offloading the CNC queue when additive manufacturing is a better solution lets them focus on the constant stream of production parts that must be made out of metal. This makes their shop more productive overall. About five months after acquiring the system, its role evolved into direct digital manufacturing. Matt and the rest of his team saw a need, so they did something about it. Before I get into the two applications, let me note that NASCAR doesn't provide much room to do things differently, 
when it comes to the cars on the track. It is stock car racing after all. To even the field and make the outcomes more about driver and pit crew skill, there's so many restrictions for each part of the car. Nevertheless, Matt has put FDM parts into the team's cars. The first example is so deceptively simple, you'd think there'd be a little value in it. It's just an oversized radio knob. Overall, a very basic part, and first glance, it seems too simple to benefit from additive manufacturing. But when you look closer at the underside of the knob, you'll see that there's a D-shaped hole in the bottom image. And that's why FDM is a better solution than CNC milling. According to Matt, the D-shaped hole would have been extremely time-consuming to mill. Without FDM, the better option would have been to cut a pocket and press fit an off-the-shelf insert. Instead of going that route, Matt simply prints up knobs as needed. In a few hours, he has all the knobs he needs for race day and doesn't have to worry about stocking inserts and scheduling assembly or CNC time. Stuart Haas Racing, the second DDM application, is for custom ducting. Each driver has a ventilation system that ports into their helmet. It supplies fresh, supplies fresh air and removes carbon monoxide during the race. Matt had several options. One, you could machine custom connections. Two, mold custom connections. Three, lay up custom connectors with carbon fiber. Or four, buy the off-the-shelf connectors. He told us that without FDM, he would have opted for option four. While cheap and labor-free, the routing path would have been a suboptimal solution. He'd be stuck with Ys, Ts, and straight-line connectors. So he opted for option five, FDM. This let Matt fully optimize the design for the best flow path, so driver comfort was maximized. But it did much more than that. Within hours of completing the final design, he had ready-to-race connectors without time and labor to set up a CNC machine, without time and labor to make molds and create parts, and without the time and labor for a carbon fiber layout. And he produces these connectors on demand, as needed. Our next team we're going to talk about is Joe Gibbs Racing. They've been using FDM for many years. Its evolution mirrors that of Stuart Haas. Several years ago, we featured them in a case study that highlighted their uses of FDM with its advantages uh, for just prototype parts. They got more prototypes into testing while leaving their CNC machines to do the production work. A few years back, we featured another case study where JGR designed, tested, redesigned, and manufactured a fix for a tire blowout between race days. Here, FDM was a concept modeling tool, functional prototyping tool, and pattern maker for carbon fiber layups. All that history led up to a recent DDM application, a carbon monoxide filter housing. For this season, JGR will produce 225 of these two-piece disposable housings, using six for each race weekend. According to Brian Levy, their design engineer, they make these in batches of 10 per day, and they do so on demand. He said that this is something they would never do with their CNCs because the long queues and setup time. Interrupting production runs really hurts the shop's throughput. He also noted that offloading the housings from the CNC machines was very beneficial since the demand for their time is so high, especially at the beginning of the race season. Levy considered molding and CNC machining before opting for FDM, but neither could match the quick turn and low cost, and it would not have been practical to use the optimized design shown to the right. As you can see, there are some features that would be tough to make any other way. Everything in a NASCAR car is subject to race uh, conditions that are very harsh and grueling. The filter housing is no exception. It's exposed to 200 degree Fahrenheit temperatures for the duration of a four-hour race. To withstand these temperatures, JGR used Stratasys polycarbonate material, and it used the brand new soluble release support material, SR100, that's compatible with polycarbonate. What that means is after a build is finished, they drop the parts into a tank and let the supports dissolve away. They just take the housing parts out of the tank, and they are ready for race day. Now let me turn over the presentation to Paul Doe to talk about FDM's role in the Grueling World Rally Car Championship. Okay, thanks, Alan. Um, so uh, who or what is ProDrive? Well, ProDrive is one of the world's largest and most successful motorsport and vehicle technology businesses. Uh, we have annual sales of around £100 million pounds. We have in the region of 700 staff around the world, in, uh, mostly in the UK, but also Australia, China, and India. 
And uh, whilst our company is rooted in motorsport, uh, now more than half our business is actually niche cars uh, and new technology for production cars. Um, we've been hugely successful in motorsport over the years. We've won six uh, World Rally Championship titles with Subaru. We've won uh, five British Touring Car titles with BMW, Alfa Romeo and Ford and uh, three class victories at Le Mans, uh, most recently with Aston Martin, but prior to that with Ferrari. Um, today, uh, we run Aston Martin Racing in the World Endurance Championship and uh, several other international sports car racing series. Uh, we run Mini in the World Rally Championship and Ford Performance Racing uh, in Australia for their um, V8 Supercar Championship. Um, but outside of motorsport, uh, our automotive technology business, uh, we, we work with lots of different major OEMs around the world, uh, helping to develop new technologies, including low emission electric uh, vehicles and fly, uh, flywheel hybrid vehicles. And also we do quite a lot of niche special edition vehicles. Um, but I'm going to focus on my own project today, which is the, the mini John Cooper Works WRC. So uh, that's the car there in the bottom right-hand corner, jumping pretty high in the air. So these cars are driven by some of the best drivers in the world, basically. And they're not driving on a circuit like a race car, so there's no chance to really learn the road and uh, optimize in that way. They, they're driving 30 miles down a, mount, uh, a road over mountains, and they're guided by notes that are read by the co-driver. So their skill is all about uh, how fast they can react and adapting to ever-changing conditions. They don't 100% know exactly what's around the next corner. So these skills that they use are quite similar to how we have to engineer the car, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, but So the events, they're racing flat out for 300 miles, sometimes of varied terrain. It um, can be on paved tarmac uh, in the mountains above Monte Carlo. could be on smooth gravel roads out in New Zealand or Finland. Uh, pretty rough, rocky roads in places like Argentina and Greece, uh, slippery, muddy conditions in the Welsh forest in the middle of winter, which is uh, pretty nightmarish, and then also the snow and ice in Sweden. Um, so the cars are basically subjected to a lot of abuse, a lot of uh, jumps, uh, exactly like the one in the photo there. Uh, the, the drivers are having to deal with rocks the size of footballs in the middle of the road, and, of course, even when things go slightly wrong, the drivers can end up off the road into uh, the undergrowth or uh, worst case trees and, and all of that's at 125 miles an hour so it's a pretty pretty abusive environment um, so I'm going to talk about the the project of how we how the mini came about uh, there was three distinct phases really to the project uh, we had a conceptualization and design phase we had a, a development testing phase once the car was uh, built test car and then we moved into a, a third phase which was rally car production and competition in the um, conceptualization phase, we started by creating a full car layout in 3D CAD, complete car. You know, that's the only way really to make an efficient and coherent design. Um, once we got a certain way down with that 3D layout in the virtual world and the architecture was frozen, we started a physical mock-up. And this was based on a, a body shell, top secret um, prototype body shell, in fact, from, sent to us by Mini um, of the new Countryman car that, that wasn't uh, in the public uh, eye at that time. Uh, and the, the primary purpose of that was to make a package evaluation because uh, in the World Rally Championship, serviceability is the key, um, or at least one of the keys. Uh, we need to be able to change just about anything on the car in 45 minutes. So we're allowed to change anything except the engine. Um, so we need to be able to change uh, forward drive transmission, turbocharger, um, all the suspension, anything on the interior, electronics, the whole lot um, within 45 minutes. So it's pretty key. So... Uh, we made the physical mock-up, and we used um, a lot of surrogate parts made in uh, off the dimension machine in ABS uh, plus material, which that's the main reason we bought the machine in the first place, was to make the surrogate parts. Um, we focused on a couple of areas. Um, one area that's always quite tricky to get right is the crew uh, ergonomics, how the, how the driver and co-driver sit in the car. So you can see on the upper photo there, there's a pedal box in the car. That was just one of the, the items in sight on the interior of the car and we used that to get the driver sat in and make sure that we had everything in the right place. They could reach all of the controls and see the, the screens and all that sort of thing. Uh, and probably more importantly from our point of view was the engine bay layout, um, which is, is pretty crowded. The lower photo there is showing uh, quite a large Garrett turbocharger. Um, behind that you can see a steering, uh, steering rack behind the engine. 
um, in the end, we built a, a complete engine bay. We had everything in there, and it's a very, very crowded. It, the Mini is a relatively small car. We've got a, a 300 horsepower engine in there, turbocharged with a large intercooler, large cooling system, four drive transmission. It was it's quite a serious installation, so we wanted to get as detailed as possible um, mock-up. Uh, and what we needed to do was to gain the, the valuable input from our experienced technicians. The guys were going to be working on the car, changing those parts in 45 minutes. We needed to check the tool access to everything, make sure everything could come out without having to remove too many other parts. Um, it, was a, it was a vital part of it. And, and there was an interesting side effect that we hadn't really sort of counted on, which was having so many surrogate parts around us in, in the complete layout so early in the project. It was really, it really motivated everyone, and it brought uh, a relatively new team of people sort of together quite closely from a, from an early point, and that was really an unexpected benefit. So, but anyway, once uh, we'd um, signed off the the design of the car and we we started building the first test car, we embarked on a uh, test regime, um, and uh, the uh, whilst a lot of the car was conventional, uh, we took risks in in certain areas um, to take, gain a competitive advantage, and you know. Um, uh, I, I think that whilst uh, we we basically we we didn't really want to take too many risks on on the risky areas if you can if you can imagine that so we didn't really want to commit to too much in the way of tooling um, and we'd seen that uh, one, from our um, mock up from the surrogate parts that they were actually very durable I mean a lot more durable than we'd expected we, in fact we had a one incident where uh, a large section of FDM transmission fell out of the uh, mock-up by a bit of a human error and bounced across our workshop and we were very surprised to find that nothing was broken um, and we thought well hang on this this is interesting maybe we could make some of the riskier parts uh, from this material on our own machine and avoid the tooling costs um, a good example of this was our airbox which is a complicated shape um, it's a difficult uh, environment also for the component it's uh, sort of quite close to an exhaust which is very very hot glowing orange in fact um, it's kind of part that perhaps in the old days we would have tried to fabricate by hand, um, but to get the shape correct and get the airflow flowing correctly, we could make the shape exactly as we wanted it on our machine. Uh, we intended the part, generally speaking, just to be the first couple of um, shakedown uh, runs for the car, um, but it, in the end it ran so well and, and managed with the temperature so well that we thought, well, well, we'll keep it on the car. And we ended up doing the first two full test sessions, which was each of those a week long on some very rough roads. And the part formed, uh, performed absolutely perfectly. And so we learned a lot from that, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, a few things came out of it. It basically helped us take the risk out of, a, effectively, a risky idea. Um, uh, and it helped us uh, save time in reaching a, a good solution. And it saved us a lot of money that we would have, could have potentially spent refining a, a tool component. Um, so after that uh, test program, we basically realised, well, we could, you know, we could perhaps make quite a few more parts out of this um, when we come to the production car. So that, that's how our sort of mindset started to change. Um, but before I move into a few of those details, I'll, I'll just make a few points here. That the WRC, in fact, isn't uh, particularly. Well, it isn't, it's, it's reasonably well-funded, but it's not as uh, well-funded as Formula One. So we, we can't throw money at, at problems, and, and you know we don't really want to either. That's not part of our engineering ethos. Um, plus, most of the cars we design and, and build are also sold to teams and individuals, so you know we need to keep the cost down. And uh, you know, even though we sell these cars, uh, our production runs are still pretty low. The, the market dictates we can probably sell around about 25 cars a year, something like that. So. You know, those three points place the big advantage of additive manufacturing, you know, especially since there's no tooling. Um, I mean, as Alan pointed out, in fact, with the NASCAR teams, uh, we also get certain advantages. We get, well, zero boundaries, really. Uh, literally, whatever we, we dream up, we can produce. We can make some shapes that can't be made any, any other way. And also, we have on-demand production. We make all of our FDM parts as we need them. That means we have no inventory, no production expense for parts sitting on the shelf, and we can also respond to requests overnight. Um, at the last count, we have 19 FDM parts uh, on our Mini, and, and more of them are coming online all the time. Um, and considering all the cars we have out there now around the world, these parts have endured um, more than 20,000 miles of uh, abusive rally competition without, without any failures. It's, it's been pretty good. So I'm going to talk about uh, three parts on the Mini 
now that we, um, we produce with FDM, each tells a slightly different story. The first one here you can see on the screen now is the driver display pod. Um, now this was uh, um, an interesting component, kind of a quite a stylized component in a lot of ways. Um, it's, you can see it there, it's sat on the steering column, it's uh, just the other side of the steering wheel, but in its position there, it's subject to a lot of harsh uh, vibrations uh, and shock loadings. Um, but it is a, it's a great example of, of the freedom of the design that the method gives us. We, we basically created a two-piece housing. Uh, there's just a rear cover that just snaps onto the front piece. Um, uh, but the main front section uh, firstly houses all of the mounting features where it screws onto the, the vehicle. And secondly, um, all the detail required to house the electronic components. Um, there's a lot of electronic components inside that housing. It's quite simple. It just has a, a numeric display for telling the driver, which reminding him which gear he's in. Um, it's a six-speed manual transmission, and there's a couple of warning lights on the side as well. Um, but in, behind that, there's a lot of uh, extra electronic uh, circuit boards and loose components and wiring, and we basically wanted to mould all of those supports for all of those pieces and even the wiring into the, into the moulding so that we could uh, minimise the chance of any fatigue fractures of any uh, wiring um, connections and the like to maximise reliability. You know, it, it, this component is really reasonably high up in the car for us, um, so weight is important. And we uh, we wanted to, you know, perhaps, well, in fact, in in the old days before we had the FDM machine, we probably would have uh, made this in carbon fibre, I imagine, something like that. Uh, and the internal design, it wouldn't have been practical to mould all of those supports for the electronics. So we would have made it a fairly basic uh, moulding, and then had several additional parts that would have been bonded on. Um, so you're talking about a lot of tooling, both uh, um, the moulding itself, plus you know any bonding jigs and unlikely uh, all the associated stuff, let alone the you know the uh, additional operations there. So you know, you, the the cost would have been pretty pretty significant, I think. But um, uh, the other feature was in was in the mounting system. Of course, we like I say it was it's high up in the car. We need to keep the weight low, but we need to keep it strong. Um, so we made the lower section where it mounts the car is. is it's hollow, completely hollow, but incorporates all the mounting um, system and it has internal bracing, and it's all one piece. You know, you can't make that any other way. You can't injection mold that, or in, and at least uh, not in one piece. And uh, you would, you know, even in composite, it would have been several pieces and a heck of a lot of bonding going on. Um, and the strength is important to us because this pod does feel every jolt that, that travels up the steering column. You know, on, on some of the big jump landings, it can be easily 5G or more. Um, yeah, and we've we've not ever ever managed to fail one of these, so that, that's pretty good going. Uh, the second uh, part I'm going to talk about is the the wheel arch uh, extensions. Um, this is a different kind of story. It's it's quite a good one actually because it shows how the response time of the of the method. Um, so World Rally is governed by the FIA. Uh, they they make the rules for our series, um, and the rules allow a lot more freedom than they have in NASCAR. Uh, you know, nearly every component on our car is, is bespoke. You know, there's, there's several thousand components, some of them quite serious, some of them just quite minor, but they are very bespoke to our car. Um, but whilst there is freedom, the car still has to conform to regulations. So uh, we have a, an inspection by the FIA uh, where the, the guys come around and they check the car, is give a full assessment over a period of two days to make sure we've complied with every regulation. Um, and basically, when, they came, when the inspectors came um, on the first day of the inspection, one of the things they spotted during that first day was that uh, uh, the treatment we'd given for the rear aerodynamic uh, configuration around the rear wheel arch, as the air exits the rear wheel arch, that didn't really comply to the regulations. I mean, the regulations are quite grey in actual fact. We'll, we'll probably call it a difference of opinion in the end in, of the grey area, but uh, we considered legal, they considered illegal, and there wasn't much we could do about it. So. Um, it was a pretty serious issue, really, because we had a car sat there ready to go to customers to compete in the Portugal Rally, which was only a week or two later. Um, so, anyway, the, the FIA guys called it a day at the end of the first day. They went back to their hotel. Uh, we set about designing a, a new part. We loaded it onto the FDM machine um, straight away um, uh, that night. Uh, and then the following morning, we came in and we fitted it to the car before the FIA game, guys came back. You can actually see it in the top. Uh, photo there, it's sort of right in the centre of the photo, the, the, the piece that extends the spat shape rearwards um, and when the FIA guys came back in they they uh, well they were incredibly surprised in fact that we had something on the car at all, let alone something that actually looked like a proper part um, 
they were very impressed with the response time basically but you know more importantly they reviewed and approved the car and we were cleared for competition so you know the cars went out to the customers and we went straight to Portugal rally and had a good run there it was it was a it was a good story that one um and all of the minis worldwide today are still racing with those FDM made wheel arch you know that's one of the examples of production parts that was fitted to the car and you know despite the, the battering they take because you know they're at the back of the wheel arch there's a lot of mud and stones thrown up from not just the rear wheels but the front wheels because the car's a four wheel drive you can see in the lower photo there the kind of abuse they like to get, you know, we've never managed to fail one yet. Um, it's it's uh, certainly a good story. Um, so the last part I'm going to talk about is, uh, well, the, the collection of hood vents on the hood. Um, this is a slightly different one, this one, because we, we had to actually turn to one of the higher temperature materials that's available. Nearly all our parts are made out of ABS plus on our own dimension machine, but this one uh, we turn to polycarbonate. Um, FDM material that's um, not only is it high temperature but but quite well, stronger and, and stiffer than the other. So uh, basically, we we have quite a lot of cooling air to extract from the engine bay to help with the, the general cooling of the package. Um, and the the vents that extract the air um, are on top of the, the hood, and the air is passing over the turbo and exhaust. And, you know, it, it comes through the intercooler and radiator first, and is probably leaving those at uh, uh, a good temperature, but then it's uh, passing over the turbine exhaust, both of which are sat there at uh, 1,800 Fahrenheit. Um, so by the time the air reaches the vents, it's, it's over 200 Fahrenheit. Um, basically, in our original design, we, we, we would have probably made the, the parts in carbon fiber. Certainly, we, that's the traditional method because, again, they're very high up in the car. We need to keep the weight to the absolute minimum. We can justify spending a bit more money there. Um, but the parts would have been very difficult to make in that layout, there's no doubt at all. And, and basically, we, we sort of decided we'd do it in um, the FDM material, and basically we were pretty glad about that as well, because when, um, at the last minute, pretty much, in the in the project, uh, we had a request from one of the styling guys from Mini uh, to, to change the, the style. Um, there was a, a concept car um, doing the rounds at the time um, that they wanted to sort of mirror some of the features, and they asked us to add uh, louvers to the centre center outlets so you know whilst our designers weren't too happy to to make a changes at the last minute you know in the end it wasn't a problem with with the machine we managed to set, print off some some new ones and and uh, being basically toolless uh, the fdm lets us alter the parts at any time really for any reason um so there's three different examples there um and uh you know it's, it's interesting we, we got the machine initially to um to make surrogate parts then we ended up deciding well hang on you know these parts are durable let's make some test parts just for testing and then during the testing we found that you know maybe actually we could be making parts on the on the rally car and that's how we are today we've got you know 19 parts on the car which are, are completely made by this method and you know um from my experience i can basically tell you that the fdm is is really capable um but at the same time it's, it's so easy to use you know one of our biggest challenges right now is, is keeping our design team reined in um since they can make pretty much anything they can design on, on the CAD, we've, they've really been coming up with some sort of wild ideas just because they can. But um, I guess lastly, you know, and quite an important point really is, you know, we, we no longer really have to work to justify using FDM. You know, in fact, as a matter of fact, for a lot of production parts, we, we just can't uh, justify not using it. Uh, in, you know, and that's, uh, that's just something we never expected. Thanks, Paul. <clears throat> it's a great example of uh, obsolescence uh, in design and tooling, and uh, you're addressing that every day, it looks like. Um, remember, it's not every day we see teams sharing their uh, advantage uh, with successes in uh, additive manufacturing, since it's such a uh, competitive advantage to them. So next time you're in front of the TV watching a race, you should ask yourself uh, just how many additively manufactured parts could be out there on the track. Uh, there's a lot more FDM parts around tracks than you'd probably believe. Uh, unless you get hired on for the pit crew, you'll never really know the answer to that. In closing, let me sum up some key points to what we discussed today. While you're doing prototype and testing work, keep an open mind and open eye to DDM applications. Most of our customers follow a similar path to that of the teams that we've shown today. FDM production parts are tough enough and precise enough for motorsports. Although you'll have to consider the requirements for each of your applications, these teams have cleared up misperceptions about material properties and precision. Look beyond the cost and time savings. While important, you'll likely find opportunities when you start looking at the bigger picture, like design freedom, 
low volume on-demand production, freedom to change designs at any time, reduce obsolete tooling, reduce labor demands, or simply offloading some work for a large CNC queue. Back to you, Kim. Great. Thank you very much, Paul and Alan, for your exciting glimpse into the racing world. So in a minute, we'll take any questions that you may have. And if you've been thinking of a question, um, please be sure to submit it through the Q&A panel on the right. Uh, I wanted to let you know that after the event today, you'll be able to find this recording um, along with a request to uh, get a sample part, download other relevant materials like the white paper on Motor Trends, um, and other things. Um, if you go to the URL on the screen, www.stratasys.com slash motor trends. Okay, it looks like during the presentation a couple questions have come in that we do have some time to take live now. Uh, looking through these, here's a question um, I think directed towards Paul. Uh, Bill is asking, what materials do you use for your FDM parts? Are all of them polycarbonate? Yeah, uh, we don't use too much in the way of polycarbonate, actually. I mean, we have our own dimension machine, which is well suited with the ABS plus material, and, and to be honest, that's what we use for, for just about everything. Um, there have been a few cases where we've done a couple of other materials. Um, I mentioned uh, in, at the end of the presentation uh, the, the polycarbonate for the, um, uh, for the hood vent. Um, we have, in fact, used some of the other materials as well. There's, there was one component in particular um, that's a, it's, it's just a simple spacer in our um, diff stop. It's, it's kind of a part that sets some of the pressure in the uh, in the transmission. Um, we we started off making that out of ABS, and in the end we ran into trouble with the the strength. You know, in the end every material has its own uh, limit, and we we couldn't make the component any bigger because it was it's quite uh, constrained packaging wise. So. Uh, the option was to increase the material strength, um, and we consulted uh, Stratasys, and in the end, um, the Ultem material, in fact, that is uh, one of the ones that was proposed. So we had the parts made in Ultem, and uh, that solved all the problems. So, yeah, we, we do use uh, a range of materials, but we do find that the ABS Plus uh, does, you know, really does cover 90% of what we make. Great. Thank you. Um, here's another good one. Charles asks, um, outside of motorsports, do you have any other examples where you're using DDM? And I think, um, Alan, why don't you take this one? Okay. Well, it's, uh, it's very similar to the way uh, it's held within racing. Uh, the companies are very slow to talk about it. Uh, there is one that we can share that does come to mind. It's uh, Koenigsegg. This uh, company makes uh, million-dollar supercars, uh, very low production runs, uh, hand-built. Uh, they do use FDM for their development and research, but the word has it their latest car has two or three FDM parts in the production version, as well as using a lot of tools and fixturing throughout their factory. Great. Thanks. Um, and it looks like we have time for one more question. Joe asks, uh, looks like directed towards Paul here, uh, what's upcoming at ProDrive and what will you be doing next with the technology? Yeah, okay. Well, we've, um, we, you yeah, know, we started making parts for the machine, but I think one of the areas that we, we're sort of experimenting quite a lot at the moment, and we, we've already got a couple of parts on the car, is, is using um, the FDM method to make tooling, um, not just alignment jigs and things like that. But we've we've actually, you know, one of the recent ones, we've done a big update on the car uh, for the start of this year uh, where we've improved the engine power, and part of, a good part of that was in a, a new duct on the intake tract and uh, this duct we decided, um, well, we needed to make it quite quickly. Usually we're always a little bit uh, rushed on the um, time scale, um, but we decided to make uh, the master model for the, for the duct in um, uh, ABS Plus, um, and we made that, uh, yeah, we made the part complete in that way, and then we gave that to our composite company who, who finished the part up and, and made a molding, uh, molded a tool straight from that, and then we have the components made out of that tool. So um, that was that was basically the quickest way and the cheapest way of having it. I think we had the the, the master was made in in only well a few days really, and, and it was only probably a week or two after we pressed the button on the design when we had you know functional parts on the car. Um, uh, we've also gone a step, well. We've done a, another kind of molding as well. We've done a, quite a bit of vac forming recently. We've done some vacuum forms where we've Made our own um, master model in in the uh, on the machine, 
and pulled some vac forming shapes off that, which has been an interesting way as well. Because in the end, once you have a ready access to a vacuum form machine, you can get those kind of parts uh, pretty. You, you know, it takes it takes one minute to do a vacuum form, doesn't it? So if you can again press the button from a CAD CAD station, have your master made in in in, well, in our case it was something like three hours, and then you can make a, a part ten minutes after that. You can you can have a vacuum form part. Um, in your hands three hours after agreeing it on the on the CAD screen, which is something that that's been quite interesting. Um, and, the, and the last one we're sort of investigating at the moment is it depends on quantities as to whether it works out well. I talked to her about making molding ducts by making a FDM master and then taking a mold from the master. Well, we're also looking into um, making soluble cores straight on the um, on a Fortis machine and then uh, molding carbon straight onto those, which is you know that's absolutely toolless um, and gets you prototypes as, you know quicker than any other method, um, and, and so we've we've had a couple of brake ducts made by that method at the way, as well. So there seems to be always new ways of, of using the stuff, um, and I think uh, yeah we look forward to see how we what, what we do after that really. Great, perfect. Well, um, so looking like that's all the time we have for today at this point. Thanks again, Alan and Paul, for your help with these questions and your great answers. Uh, if we didn't get to your question live on the call, we'll be sure to follow up with you via email afterwards. Um, we'd like to thank each of you for your attention during this presentation, and now I will turn it over to our operator who will close out the event. Hello again. This is Mike Anderson back with you live. As I mentioned earlier, because this was a pre-recorded presentation, any questions you submitted will not be answered today, but will be passed on for answering. Additive manufacturing is receiving a good deal of consideration these days, as interest focuses on what many people consider to be a new technology. However, ME Media and uh, its parent organization, SME, is no newcomer to additive manufacturing. SME has been involved with it for decades. For instance, SME's Rapid Technologies and Additive Manufacturing Community has been serving and supporting the technology for years. Additive manufacturing also receives extension, extensive coverage in Manufacturing Engineering Magazine. In the upcoming April issue, contributing editor Eileen Wolf looks at additive use in the medical manufacturing field. And in the June issue, Terry Wollers of consulting group Wollers Associates discusses how additive is going mainstream. Wollers knows what he's talking about. In a vote of more than 1,000 industry professionals from around the world, Wollers was selected as the number one most influential person in rapid product development and additive manufacturing. In addition, from June 9th through 12th, SME will host Rapid 2014, North America's definitive additive manufacturing event at Kobo Center in Detroit. This will be the 21st such event SME has hosted. Terry Wollers will be one of the keynote speakers. If you'd like to learn more about this annual event, please visit www.sme.org slash rapid. Thanks for joining us today. We hope you found the presentation informative. 